Thank you so much for joining me uh, We're now live on Facebook And uh, we're going to be talking about a very important subject Which is preaching uh, The value and the power of preaching And specifically, uh, preaching over lecturing in the pulpit So thanks for your time And I look forward to this discussion with both of you Before we start, I'm going to open us with prayer And then we'll go on from there Let's pray our Heavenly Father, how we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we thank you for the gospel message that has been revealed to us in him by your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you bless our discussion today on this very important subject that is valuable and necessary for salvation, but also for our growth in grace. Bless everyone who's watching now live, but also those who watch the recordings after, that in the end, we'll all be blessed and encouraged to walk more humbly with you, strengthened in our most holy faith, and that you'll be glorified. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, uh, if your mic is mute, muted, please unmute yourself, and uh, I would like to just introduce our discussion, but before that, um, thank you, Barry. Barry uh, is the uh, Barry York is the president of the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. You can talk more about that if you wish. Uh, and William is in Scotland. He's a managing director of Christian Focus Publications in Scotland. Welcome, guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. So, Barry, you want to start? Uh, just maybe a little bit about yourself, and then. Uh, just some maybe opening thoughts on preaching as you understand it and as you've experienced it yourself as a pastor uh, and also now as a teacher at the at at seminary there. Well, before I came to RPTS, I was a pastor out in the state of Indiana, a church planter for over 20 years. And so spent a lot of time uh, ministering God's word to his people and still uh, enjoy doing so. I've been here in Pittsburgh for since uh, 2013, uh, I came here as the professor of pastoral theology and homiletics. So the subject's uh, uh, always on my heart uh, with respect to preaching. I enjoy, as I say, coaching the boys here uh, in that regard. And uh, the last couple of years, I've been serving as president as well. I'm a married, have uh, a wife of 35 years, uh, six children, seven grandchildren. So they're my heart's uh, joy. Uh, with respect to uh, preaching, and particularly the idea of uh, what distinguishes it from teaching. Uh, just to get a start, I won't say a whole lot, so William can uh, introduce himself, but I, I like uh, one of the things that Dabney says in his book, uh, Evangelical Eloquence, or what was known as the art of sacred rhetoric, where he really describes that preaching is uh, the soul's virtuous energy being communicated to someone else. So that's not only the communication of ideas, but there's a, a moral force uh, in preaching uh, that's to really captivate minds, strike hearts, and move wills as it's as it's being done. So uh, we can we can, I guess, start with a, that simple definition from Dabney and, and move on. Yeah, thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction, William. Uh, Please just introduce yourself to our viewers and say a little if words on preaching. I have uh, been married for 52 years. That so I was thinking when he said that, I better work out how long I'm married. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, 52 years of wedded warfare. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have three daughters and eight grandchildren and another one expected. Uh, anyway, preaching. I have been listening to preaching since I was a child, and it has become a, a very important part of uh, my life. I greatly appreciate preaching. And some of the best preaching I have ever heard 
is the most plain preaching from the most ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that we need to, we don't need the big conference speaker. Mm -hmm. It's McChain who said, preach Christ for awakening, Christ for comforting, Christ for sanctifying. Now, one of the best definitions I have of preaching is again from McChain. Most ministers, he says, are accustomed to set Christ before the people. Now, that sounds quite good. Mm -hmm. Accustomed to set Christ before the people. They lay down the gospel clearly and beautifully. That sounds good too. But then he says, they do not urge men to enter in. Now God says, exhort, beseech, persuade, not only point to an open door, but compel them to come in. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that is, in my view, it maybe not such a humble view as it should be, but in my view, that is a missing element in many who came out of the seminaries of the world today. They need to be told it's not just telling about Jesus. It's compelling them to come in. That's my definition of preaching. Amen. Amen. From, <laughs> from, from, from one, of my, one of my favorite preachers who I never heard, Mary McChain. Yes, yes. Um, um, what you, when you were talking about how you've heard some of the greatest preaching you've heard has been from ordinary people. And as I was thinking about this myself, I would say amen to that because growing up in Malawi, for example, I've heard preaching of, from all kinds of people and having been here in the West also from PhDs, but the best preaching I've heard, I remember is a man from Malawi. He never even finished uh, high school. He didn't even go to high school at all. He's a, he's a poor, we could say poor group village headman, but he's a man of the word. And when he handles the Bible and he opens his mouth to preach, I mean, you feel the power of the Holy Spirit working uh, in and through you. <laughs> Just say, it's so powerful. I've never really experienced anything like that. Um, and yet, this is a very simple man that most of the world would never hear about. But he has such power and force in his preaching. And I want he, to read... What, what, he, what he did if you don't mind me saying so, is he spent as much time in prayer with God as he did in preparation with the commentary or with the original text. Exactly. Yes. He came out from the presence of God and God came down. I, I, I've heard wonderfully clever and intellectual sermons and I'm longing that we would have the prayer, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. That's what I tell my students is their very first assignment in every homiletics class is that they, they have to form a prayer team <laughs> because without, their, without the support of prayer, without them being in prayer, there's not going to be any power. We want men that are as Peter and John were described in Acts 4.13, that uh, they weren't trained. And I tell my students as you're at a seminary, but uh, I've heard a lot of gifted men preach that never darkened the door of a seminary and they preach Christ and people heard the word of God. And because they were like Peter and John, that though they were untrained men, uh, they were seen by the council there in Jerusalem that were accusing them of preaching the gospel that they said they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And so Lovely. you need to know that you've been with Jesus uh, if you're going to really uh, be able to effectively minister the word of God to their, to their souls. McChain said, prayer is more important than preaching. Mm -hmm. And it's prayer that gives preaching all its power. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, wanted to I would like to read here from Romans 10, um, because it's a very important subject, uh, passage on the subject. Uh, verse 14, how then, 
uh, let me begin a little bit further, perhaps. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And then verse 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, the Lord, Lord who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And I mean, we, we, we all know um, that preaching is the means that God will primarily use to bring salvation to sinners and also to, uh, to, to build up life in the, the godly life, the Christ-like life in the lives of ch his children, the believers. Uh, and so preaching has a very central place in Christianity, in the life of the Christian from beginning to end. And yet, uh, as we've been talking about, it seems like there's a, a deficiency of real biblical preaching in the churches today all around we hear a lot of good talks sometimes good lectures even very theologically sound lectures but it's not preaching what's missing there was a an old man a preacher in scotland he was a noted man for his passion and one evening he was pouring out his heart and his soul and his body into delivering this sermon. And he was conscious that he might be criticized. He was a Calvinist of the first order. And in the middle of the sermon, he boldly declared, if that's Armenianism, I'm full of it. Now, some of us in the Reformed conservative world are afraid of bending the knee. I pray you, I plead with you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Yeah, and you, what you're saying, William, just reminds me of uh, John Murray, the late Professor John Murray, uh, how he described preaching as a personal, passionate, plea. and I want to come back to that, William, in a moment. But Barry, do you want to say anything uh, on that? I I really agree with what William's saying, and I often point students and preachers to the end of the sermon at Pentecost. Uh, we often think it ended when. Uh, uh, Peter ends with this Jesus whom you crucified and they're pierced to the heart. What do we need to do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized. We think kind of that's the end of the sermon, but the, the text says that he, with many other words, continued to plead with them to be saved from this wicked and corrupt generation. And we do have to plead uh, with people. And uh, it's, it's not unreformed to be pleading because God uses means. And, and those verses that you read from Romans, I think it's interesting. Uh, James Boyce has pointed this out, uh, where the question, how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? The of isn't in the original text. How are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And preaching, the preacher has to preach by faith and believe that God spirit is working through him so that people aren't hearing his voice, but the voice of Christ speaking to them. As it says in uh, Luke 10, 16, he who listens to you listens to me. And so the preacher has to be convinced that what he's truly bringing to the people of God as he prays and prepares and then uh, enters the pulpit or goes stands on a, on a preach, uh, street corner is that he is bringing to people the very word of, of God that the very spirit of Christ is using to speak through him to, to God's people. And that puts... That puts a deeper love in your heart, a deeper a desire in your heart to uh, see people respond to the word of God. And so um, 
that's not unreformed. <laughs> here, here, here's a question for you preachers. Do you, do you expect yes. people to be converted yes. when you preach? Yeah, I mean, and to be hard. very honest, I've I've shared that I've been. There are times in my ministry when I look back and I realized I wasn't preaching that way. I've had to repent, had to repent uh, over it. Um, Bonar's book, uh, "Words to Winners of Souls," he has actually the Scottish Church their their confession uh, of the men there confessing over their failure to preach that way. And I think I like to go back to that and just pray through some of the things they have there because it can be a, it can be in our hearts. So we need to make sure that we're, we're pre preaching by faith. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, I think what really distinguishes lecturing from preaching, preaching from lecturing is that in preaching, we're not just giving out information. We're expecting a response and actually we're enlisting a response of faith obedience and trust in the lord jesus christ and mm -hmm. people cannot just walk away and say oh that was a good sermon but you know they'll be like if they're not converted they'll be like what must i do to be saved you know because they've heard such powerful pleading uh, and powerful and clear presentation of the gospel and those who are in christ you know should even be you know like move do i love jesus more uh, how can I love him better? How can I serve him better? How can I trust him better? Uh, so there must be some kind of response. What sins do I, do I need to repent of and get rid of in my life um, so that I can be more like Jesus? Um, and I, I pray that we'll see more of that kind of preaching in our day because we need it. Uh, we need... Well, I, I, I need it too. It's not, it's not the world out there that needs it. It's the truth. I need it, yeah. And, you know, like, as Pharaoh was saying, you know, every time, you know, when the word of God is rightly preached, Christ is speaking. And to know that is very empowering for a preacher, but also it's just a, yeah, like it's a, it's a great blessing to know yeah. that God wants to speak and chooses to speak through us. Fletcher, I think you're pointing out uh, one of the real distinctions between preaching and teaching. And when we teach... Um, and we are imparting information, uh, and again, depending on some of the things we're teaching, but it not always carries this moral force behind it. But uh, so, if I'm teaching math or teaching, even teaching theology, um, it doesn't necessarily have uh, moral force if I'm talking about different views of eschatology. But when we're preaching, there's always a moral force uh, behind it that we are calling people to sacred to sacred belief and duty. You heard the story perhaps about Rabbi Duncan in uh, Aberdeen. He had 300 theology students in his class and it was, the, it was their best and their most remarkable lecture they ever heard. And he came into the, the lecture room and he stood at the front with his handkerchief in his hand and this was the summation of his lecture. Damnation. 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 And he took it willingly and with tears he left the platform. Now they don't forget that sermon or that lecture. And I would say that those who are lecturing in seminaries should be looking for occasions when they can change their lecture into a sermon. Mm -hmm. They should be looking for ways to do that. And it's easy for me to do to say that because I don't have that responsibility. <laughs> yeah, but uh, William, you, you, you know, I think what you're saying is, is worth really considering uh, because especially in the reformed circles, we have a terrible problem, a terrible tendency of perhaps leaning to more intellectual understanding of the faith and you know, all the high you know, views about God and theology and all of those things. And we need to, we need to, you know, I, I always tell people we need to love God with all of our soul, mind, heart, mind, and strength. But we focus too much sometimes perhaps on the mind and not on the heart. And there's always, there's usually a disconnect there uh, and we leave people sort of like feeling 
intellectually excited uh, you know about gospel truths intellectually stimulated but their hearts remain cold and unchanged and that's very sad and dangerous uh, so uh, i i agree with what you're saying that i think this problem can be better solved in the seminaries where these where where, where, where preachers are sort of uh, trained uh, and then sent into the pulpit uh, that they need to go having been prepared to preach in the pulpit, not to lecture. Manny McChain, to come back to him, he was very friendly with uh, Andrew Boner, and he thought the world of Andrew Boner, as I do. And uh, on one occasion, he heard Andrew Boner in, in McChain's own pulpit and wrote him a letter saying, your sermon was very good, but there was not enough of Christ and not enough passion. And he also said it was a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, 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 I think there was something to be learned there from, that he loved Boner enough to tell him and Boner loved McChain enough to receive it. it, it the pastor needs to be helped by his people or his elders or his friends to say, you could do this. Yeah. Yeah. And the pastor should be willing to receive it. Absolutely. John Stott had a doctor in his congregation who phoned him every Monday, mm. not to tell him how well he did, but to tell him any mistakes he made or anything he could have done better. And that was a very important part of John Stott's life and ministry. It was the same man. He had great confidence in him. And he told him on the Monday, well, you could have. You should have, you might have. Yeah. I want to talk uh, just uh, very, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Martin Lord Jones as well as you are, William. Um, I, I mean, again, just powerful preaching from the late Dr. Lord, Martin Lord Jones. And when you hear his sermons, and thank, I'm thankful that they've been preserved and we can still, you know, listen to them online or wherever. Ah, your heart is stirred, and you feel the spirit of God moving, you know, through the man, uh, and how he described preaching as logic on fire. Uh, I want us to just kind of, you know, discuss that a little bit because, again, we don't see much of that today uh, in in preaching. It's very cold, very dull, very boring, sad to say, uh, and devoid of the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, why is that the case and what can we do to remedy that? Well, one of the things you have to realize is that God does give certain men certain gifts and uh, we're not all Lloyd-Jones, but uh, we can still learn from him and it's important to do so. I think part of it, you guys are, you know, taking some shots at the seminary. So let me, uh, let me, uh, acknowledge, acknowledge that I think it is a problem in the seminaries and how we train men to preach. I do believe that some from the way I have seen, uh, we're trying not to do this here, but the way I've seen uh, seminaries train men is that they fill them with so much knowledge and the ability to study the scriptures. And then the homiletics classroom just becomes a further extension of that. And there's not a distinction between hermeneutics which is the science of interpretation, all the things we do to understand the Bible, and homiletics, which is the proclamation. And Lloyd-Jones says that he wishes that the, the whole idea of preaching was just limited, not even so much to the content of the message, but to the delivery of it and the expression of Christ uh, through the message. And so I think it has to do some with how men are being trained. What we really try to do here at RPTS is... Um, I get the guys, they're preaching every week. Like my homiletics classroom is, is a workshop um, where we're having them do presentations. And uh, one of the things William said is uh, the, the critique that was offered is that it was just too long. And so I get these guys doing exercises where in two or three minutes, they have to defend a homiletical point or do a sermon illustration or give their introduction. In our chapel, uh, the men only get 20 minutes behind the pulpit and the bell's going to ring. And I tell them, you got to be done before the bell is rung. And I want you to preach in that time frame 
a, a solid biblical message because you can extend it longer when you go out and you should when you go out to a congregation but you got to also learn to preach shorter there's times where we only have 10 minutes to do a devotion or 15 minutes to do an evangelistic presentation somewhere and so you have to learn to preach at different lengths and so I think it's part of how we're training men in, in seminaries. They're, they're to be uh, really seeking to communicate. Um, and we have to focus on how to communicate the gospel uh, to people effectively, not just deliver information about the gospel. And that's what uh, Lloyd-Jones says. He says we're to preach the gospel, not to preach about uh, the gospel. Yeah. Yes, I, I think... Uh... There was something to be said for the, the model of the log cabin. There was something to be said for the model that the Free Presbyterian Church had in Scotland over many years. The, the, the tutors were, were a pastor in a congregation, and the students went with that pastor for a year to do their various classes, and they were preaching regularly and they were getting a little bit of advice from the pastor. So mm -hmm. they weren't arriving as a reverend so-and-so or as a senior pastor without having had a lot of feedback. So I think that there's something to be said for, I'm glad to hear you've got the young men out preaching regularly. Our motto That's here is study under pastors. All our professors are pastors and because they're connected in churches, we're, we're continually getting our guys out preaching through them, under them, um, trying to get them to preach at uh, the Rescue Mission Chapel or the Teen Challenge. Uh, so you, you learn to preach by preaching, not by listening to just someone tell you about it. And so uh, just like playing the violin, you got to practice to get the notes right. You got you to gotta be preaching in order to learn, to learn how to Here's a quote from Mr. Spurgeon. A sermon without Christ is an awful, horrible thing. Uh -huh. Right? Yes. Yeah? A sermon without Christ, you'd be as well to try and make a loaf of bread without any flour. Yeah. 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 And that's a very good uh, point, William. And I want to sort of like run with that for a little bit longer uh, because... We'll be, we'll be just been talking about you know okay lecturing in the pulpit and how that's not appropriate uh, but also we have these dynamic speakers i would say uh, in the pulpit who are you know on fire passionate lively attention getting but they're not preaching christ as you are saying william they 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 they're preaching they're, they're not even preaching we'd say they're motivational speakers and they can motivate a crowd and rally a crowd um do you see that? And why is that? Why do people sort of tend to gravitate towards that, uh, to find it very attractive in some ways? We love being entertained. And uh, the, uh, the television is so engaging. You know, we don't have to think too much. Uh, uh, we're living in a world where we like being entertained. And preaching is not entertainment. Yeah? although we would like to make it entertaining. Fill it with nice, funny stories and the people will go out smiling. Fill it with the gospel of Christ and the people will go out speechless. I think too, men who are preachers can never forget the mercy that God's given to them. That's the one thing that always strikes me about the apostle Paul is in his writings and description of his ministry, just never, he never forgot the mercy that had been given to him. And I think that's, I, I think you can sense that when a man's preaching and it, it's Christless, it just seems like he's not, he's not been experiencing that mercy of the Lord in his own life. And that's why I think he can, people can preach even like they could be very gifted. And as you're saying, have, um, entertaining stories and that type of thing and get a titter out of the congregation. But uh, we have to be experiencing the mercies of Jesus uh, every day, never forgetting what, what he did for us. Um, being like there was a, 
Newton yeah. just saying, you know, the older I get, the more I just keep, you know, two things I just come to is yeah. I'm a great sinner and I have a great savior. And we, we just have to have that sense uh, as we preach uh, yeah. regarding that. There was a, a man called Jackie Ross. He was a minister in the Highlands of Scotland. He, he started an organization called the Blythewood and he had loads of notes as a young man going into the pulpit. He was not an entertaining speaker, but he cried when he was speaking and pleading with sinners. He had tears in his eyes. He meant it. And that is such a glorious thing. That's a different thing. Don't, I'm not telling you to get an onion and manufacture the tears. But what, I'm, what, I, what I'm saying is, if you really believe that the people you're speaking to might never hear the gospel again, a dying man to dying men. And if you believe God's word is what they need and they don't need it tomorrow, they need it now as the accepted time, there'll be tears in your heart, mm -hmm. if not in your eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, we see that, you know, urgency of preaching, you know, in, in the Apostle Paul. Um, uh, in Corinthians 5, um, I'll read a longer passage from verse 16 to the end of that chapter. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, or the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And you know what you both have been saying is so powerful. And I think anybody, the example of uh, Jack Ross, uh, William, Anybody who understands the, the reality of hell and then stands in the pulpit, the reality of hell and heaven, that you know you could end up in heaven or you could end up in hell, depending on what you do with the gospel of Christ, then cannot present the gospel in a cold, non-involved, non-passionate way. Like, yes, those tears must come. Your heart would be stirred up so much because you want to these men and women listening to you, young and old, whoever they might be, to be reconciled to God because it's a matter of life and death, you know? And now is the time. You may never have another chance to present this powerful message to them. And so I think we, pr we need to pray for more of that in the pulpit, that the men who are, getting up there to present the gospel who have this deep conviction in their hearts that it's a matter of life and death mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily the articulation and the presentation skills yes. it's something much deeper than that you know the chat as i said at the very start it could be a very plain man a very plain preacher but when he has that understanding of what the need is. Here's something I was thinking of as you were speaking. It's about Mr. Spurgeon, one of his greatest sermons. It was called, Compel Them to Come In. And he start, this is how he started the sermon. I am so much happy to tell you the gospel, to tell you to obey this gospel. I'm not going to have an introduction at all. I'm not yeah. going to, I'm going to go straight to it. I'm going to compel you to come in. I can't wait for an introduction. I've got to do it now. 
<laughs> so we, we, we might say, oh, well, we'll get to the gospel. Yeah. We'll, we'll maybe 25 minutes in, but Mr. Spurgeon, on this occasion, on Luke 14, 23, on compel them to come in, it's a very famous sermon. Uh -huh. I'm going to get on with it right away. Well, it's that urgency we're talking about, right? The urgency yeah. of like, the message has got to get out now, not tomorrow, not 25 minutes later, but right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and it, it, sorry, uh, go ahead, Barry. Oh, I was just going to add to what William's saying. Uh, I was actually teaching yesterday about different introductions people can do to a sermon, but one of them is the ramrod, where you just go right at it, and <laughs> that's a good example of yeah. it. Speaking of introductions, one of the great conclusions, I heard it myself, was from John Stott. It was the last time I heard him. And he had been, he always preached for 30 minutes, sometimes 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, never any longer. But anyway, he had preached on this part, part, part of Ephesians, I think it was. And he finished the sermon by saying, here's my conclusion. Ten fingers, ten words. Love God, love one another because he first loved us. Now, that's, that's childlike talk. Yeah. And I went to him afterwards and I said, that was a very helpful, I'll never forget that. You didn't. <laughs> and he, and he, but then he said, I put a lot of effort into my first sentence and into my last sentence. It was quite an interesting, and you'll not forget it either. Oh. 10 fingers, 10 words. That was the summary. And to be able to summarize the sermon, I found that so helpful with my own children at lunchtime. What was the sermon about? And if they didn't get something, I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 25, 22, uh, the text that God used to bring Spurgeon to faith, you know, preached by this poor preacher. Or, ordinary so man. Ordinary man, turn unto me or look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And mm. I think another thing that is lacking in our pulpits today is a high view of God. Um, that yeah. Can, no other in all the world but God. Um, and he is the one to whom all of us who have to give an account at the end of his life. And he's the only one that can save us. As a, as a publisher of many, many commentaries, I have a lot of stories about how commentaries are used. I want pastors to use commentaries, but not as the first source. I remember being in a church and I could tell you the church and the location. And I was first time, the only time I was ever there. And I heard this young man who was just finished seminary, he was an assistant pastor and he gave a very good sermon. And I came out of the church and he was at the door and he met me and he said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Scotland. What do you do? Oh, I'm a publisher, Christian Focus. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned it. I said, I know. And I know the book it came from. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Now, now, that's happening a lot. Now, yeah. I, I, I'm very happy for people to use, to use commentaries. And I'm very happy for them to use without referring to them. But I want the word to be in their own heart. Uh -huh. I want it to be filtered through their own personality. You know, unless God, remember Sinclair Ferguson at a Ligonier conference, who do you like listening to? And they asked Alistair Begg and they asked John MacArthur and whoever. And then they asked Sinclair, who do you like listening to? And there was a few thousand people there. Who do you like listening to Sinclair? And he said, myself. Yes. <laughs> and there was a gasp you know what, what kind of fellow is this and he said well if the word hasn't spoken to my heart there's something missing 
yeah and i think that's very important i think uh, i would say amen to that not because i think my preaching is great but what i preach the gospel that i preach is great and i seek with god's help every time i i get the opportunity to actually present christ to the people and this is a message that i want to hear too and i love it uh, there's a hymn i love to tell the story of jesus and his love um and those who have heard it love they love to hear it even more <laughs> because it's just so sweet it gets sweeter every time you hear it um and so you, what you're saying uh, was reminding me of uh, the story of Makshen. You, made, you mentioned earlier uh, William, how he would really come from the presence of God, so to speak. And when he stood in the pulpit, like, before he even said anything, people started weeping. There's a, I'm sorry to, uh, anyway, the story came to mind. That somebody went to visit McChain's church and spoke to the church officer and said, what's the secret of McChain's preaching? And the church officer said, come and I'll show you. Took him into McChain's office and pointed to him the desk. And on the desk, there was a white, little white circle. So the visitor said, what's that all about? That's the secret. What is that? That, when Mr. before he goes in to preach, he's got his head in his hands at his desk and the tears are falling from his eyes. That's the mark of McChain's tears on the desk before he goes to the pulpit. Now, that's, that, that moves me today. Powerful. Eh? Powerful. Yeah, it's pretty hard if uh, a man's bypassing that heart work. I often tell the students I'm <clears throat> struggling to know how to get to the main idea of the sermon or I understand the text, but I can't, I don't know what to preach. And so often it's just a matter of prayer. It's a matter of my own heart uh, having the sense of the spirit of the text. And, and then I get moved and it, it helps the sermon. So I can do all the mechanical things that you get taught at a seminary but you have to it's a spiritual work and you have to really rely on the spirit of god to to help you and these men that you referred to who are plagiarizing sermons or using the words of another um how there's no way that they've gotten that word of god down in their heart if they're if they're doing that they've just bypassed their heart oh, yeah, it's was- not going to help the congregation ultimately yeah, that's how you end up with the late lectures, you know, because then you yes, just trying to figure yes. out information. Um, you, you know, we want people to, when they hear us preach, that they'll say something like, you know, this man has been in the presence of God and we've been there with him. No, Fletcher, I disagree with you. We, we want them to say, we see no man save Jesus only. Amen. <laughs> amen, amen. Yeah, we want to see Jesus at the end of the day, you know. But That's we, right. And, and that's the goal of preaching, that Christ the, is... The, yeah, the Erskins were saying, we want people to see Christ past us. Mm. Because they were going to hear Erskine. That's no use. We want to see Christ past us. Yes. Yeah. Now we're, we're coming to close to the end of our discussion here. I want to just for a few moments... Uh, speak to people in the pews because you know okay let's say that the preachers now have got their act together you know they're really you know preaching christ and christ is being you know heard or he's being proclaimed uh, faithfully from the pulpit the people have a responsibility to receive that word to listen uh, what word current advice would you have to those who sit in the pews uh, with regards to listening to the gospel sermons. Well, I think that's the other half of preaching is that they uh, they need to come ready to hear, to not just be merely hearers only who delude themselves, but those who obey properly and respond to the word of God. And I think that, um, you know, again, this is the beauty of pastoral ministry when a a man is committed to a local flock and he's shepherding them 
he should be knowledgeable of his flock. Um, one of my mentors would say that when you studied for your sermon, you're, you're only half done because you now have to study your congregation to whom you're speaking so that you're ministering the word to the people. And if a shepherd's coming and lovingly communicating God's truth to his people, the people should come with that same desire to, to receive it. So they, they have to be much in prayer. They should be praying for their preacher and they should be praying for their own hearts uh, uh, to be ready to receive what God has to say to them. It, uh, it, it, when my wife makes my lunch, it's wonderful to have an appetite. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really long for a developed appetite for the word of God. We're not there to pass the time. We're not there to learn only. We're there to meet with Christ and to come to say thank you. It, it's worship. It, Martin Lloyd-Jones gave a sermon in Glasgow and he said, he said, what do you think the church is for? What do you think the sermon is for? And he gave 10 answers. And they were all sounded very good. And then he said, all of these answers are missing the point. God is seeking worshipers. That's the answer. And if we were going to meet the Queen of England next Sunday morning, we would be there in time. We would be ready for it. We'd be thinking about it the day before. Our late queen mother used to get the text for the next day and read the chapter for the next day on the Saturday. But I am afraid that we're more inclined to spend our time uselessly. It's, it's, it's a major event worshiping together and expecting to meet with Christ. And you don't have that unless you have an appetite. Uh, this is a very important subject. Maybe we can come back at another time um, and talk about how can we help the people in the pews to listen to sermons to their benefit, spiritual benefit. Because, yes, it's one thing to have a great preacher in the pulpit who is exhorting Christ and clearly sounding the gospel message. But if the people in the pews are not prepared, prepared to listen and they don't have an appetite, then something is also missing there. And so we can come back perhaps at another time to talk about this. Uh, just some closing remarks from both of you. Uh, and then at the end, I'll ask William to close in prayer, if you would, please. Well, just along these lines, I we can remember that Jesus preached to the seven churches of Asia and each of his messages ended with the same refrain, that they were to hear what the spirit is saying to the church. And so I do think that it's so important for congregations, for the people of God to, to as William was saying, to hunger or thirst for that. It's just so, so important to, to want to hear what God has to say to us. Yeah. Amen to that. And it's, uh, I forgot actually that this was going out around the world. So I just thought the three of us were sitting uh, quietly. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I have spoken inadvisedly in my criticisms of the seminary, but uh, I wouldn't, I would, wouldn't think it would be a bad idea for us to have some preachers that went through Martin Lloyd Jones's seminary. He never went to seminary at all. Yep. And yep. I, I, I think while the seminary is wonderful and important, we need men that are called by God. Sent and go, the yeah, and, and, and go in the strength of God and in dependence on God. So we'll pray together. Lord, we ask that we would become increasingly dependent on the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the promise. If ye being evil, 
and we are. Know how to give good gifts to your children, and we do. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Come, Lord, in a day of your power to do something we try to do so often in our own strength, but we cannot. Come to awaken the dead and to revive the living. We pray that the people around us and who worship with us would come to your house with the language of the psalm that I, the beauty of the Lord, behold me and admire, and that I in his holy place may reverently inquire. I joyed when to the house of God. Go up, they said to me. Lord, we pray for each other and any who may take a minute or two to listen to what we've said. Grant that there would be honor and glory to your name. We pray for Barry and the ministry of the seminary there. Grant that they would know your grace and strength and provision. That they would lift up their eyes and see that the fields are white and ready to harvest. And that you would send forth laborers into that harvest. Help and uphold Fletcher and his ministry and family. Make them polished for you. Keep them for you. Prepare us for your will. Pardon us for our sins. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. God bless you. Uh, lovely. And I hope that we'll get to do this again in the future. Thank I'll you. have no more stories next time. You've got all my <laughs> stories already. <laughs> I, I kind of doubt that. <laughs> Very good. Okay. God bless you. Bye. Bye.